God, this really brings back memories, this here school yearbook. It just reminds me that the duds, they usually stay the duds. And most of us were caught in the middle of popular and unpopular, and we're usually kind of forgotten about at the end of the day. Some people have glow ups though, and that's always exciting to see. But the people we really focus on after high school are the popular kids. Now, some of the popular kids, they stayed popular. They were deemed popular, they only got more popular. Even if there wasn't really anything new coming about them, they just stayed the way they are and they were golden. And others, they were bought out by EA. Video games, much like movies, stands as artifacts of the passing of time, particularly in the last couple decades. As technology has grown, video games have grown, and as video games have grown, we've grown. So I'm here to take a viewing of Star Wars games in particular and their growth over time to see just how far we've come, or in some cases, how we could probably pay to go back a little bit and take ideas from the past. Star Wars Empire Strikes Back 1982 released on the Atari 2600 and in television consoles and is predictably an adaptation of the movie. The general premise of the game is that the player takes on the role of the rebel pilot who is trying to prevent AT-ATs from reaching their goal of destroying the rebel base. Like most Atari 2600 games, this one is no joke. Each AT-AT takes 48 hits to kill, and combining that with their own retaliation makes this game nearly impossible to win. There are cheat codes. There's a blast from the past kind of turn. Next thing you know, we'll be hitting up Blockbuster and calling each other on landlines. That will make the player invincible, and even one will allow the player to play as an AT-AT. Return of the Jedi got its own 2600 treatment with the form of Star Wars Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle, which came out in 1983, same as the movie. This game predictably puts the player in the Millennium Falcon tasked for destroying the next Death Star. You would think that the next release would finally be an adaptation of A New Hope, right? Give me your money because you're wrong. Kind of. Personally, if you showed this footage to me without my already knowing what it was supposed to be, I would tell you this looked like the worst game of pinball ever. Which, considering your main objective is to whack these lightsabers back and forth to deflect the simulator, that's basically what it is, competitive pinball. A new hope skipped console adaptation altogether, actually, and went right for the arcade in 1983 under the incredibly original title, Star Wars The Arcade Game. This vector-like game centered around the Battle of Yavin as the player takes the role of Luke Skywalker with the main goal of survival. Damn it! It's split into three phases. Airspace above the Death Star, the surface of the Death Star, and the trench. It differed from other games because the main goal wasn't to destroy every enemy thrown in front of you. Despite its look, this game in a lot of ways inspired future games to come and sort of became the precedent of a successful Star Wars game. It featured the voices of many characters from the movie and was the first in its time to do so, which likely contributed to its wide success. It was so popular that it eventually did make its way onto Atari consoles of the time, and of course it spawned sequel arcade units of The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. We may have not seen another Star Wars movie in the 90s until the very tail end with 1999. But we sure did get a boatload of quality video games. You get back in your corner where you belong. Graphically, the two Star Wars NES games we got in 1991 were a drastic improvement over what we'd seen before. They're both side-scrollers and unlike the previous games, are much longer in playtime. Interestingly, the Super Nintendo was already out, so the games kind of got overshadowed by the Star Wars Super Nintendo games that would release shortly after, but they were still well made for the time and considerably difficult. Still no save modes in these games, but it was worth edging towards that point, as the games were getting increasingly long and diverse in their stages. We were growing beyond simply focusing our games on just one stage, like the Battle of Hoth or the Battle of Yavin, but showcasing a whole slew of scenes from the movies. Super Star Wars, though, this was where it was at. Nintendo may have been late to the Star Wars game, but they would take their piece of the pie soon enough. And while yet another adaptation of the movies, it just totally betters everything about its previous products on a visual and theatrical level. The sound in particular was a vast improvement over what fans were used to with 8-bit sound to accompany 8-bit graphics. These games seem to actually try a little bit. 
They stayed mostly faithful to the movies with changes for the sake of making this a game and not just, you know, the movie. However, if you're looking to have a nice and relaxing playthrough, stay away. But if you're looking to know the non greedo Rodian in the Cantina at the time is named Brito, look no further. Of course, Nintendo weren't the only ones getting Star Wars video games. There's always the divide between console and PC gamers, right? Well, PC gamers weren't left out of the Star Wars loop for too long with the release of X-Wing and Rebel Assault in 1993. Both games offered unique experiences never quite explored in games prior and served as completely original stories set around the original trilogy. X-Wing was the first of its kind with the special graphics that deviated away from bitmaps and used 3D polygons that were inspired by World War II flight simulators. The game was divided into three tours, the first of which involved discovering new allies for the Rebellion as well as uncovering the Imperials' campaign against the Rebels. The second detailed the protection of Leia's TV 4 and discovery of the Death Star. And the third put the player in the position of Luke Skywalker during the Battle of Yavin. Rebel Assault is actually the first Star Wars game to allow the player to technically play as a female if they so please. Also released in 1983, the game takes Luke Skywalker out of the equation and instead labels the player Rookie 1. Rookie 1 basically takes the place of Luke in this game, and while the actual content was revolutionary, the quality was a given, since they were accurate 3D renderings and contained digitalized footage and music from the actual movies. Its level of canon was held in question for a while, as not only is the main character not Luke Skywalker who destroys the Death Star, but it also traverses through events like the Battle of Hoth, which obviously didn't occur until much later in canon. Both of these games rightfully got sequels, with X-Wings coming the following year in 90 form in the form of TIE Fighter and Rebel Assault 2 hitting the scene in 95. TIE Fighter is actually the first ever game that puts the player on the side of the Empire, and like its predecessor came with a companion booklet that set the scene for the events of games acting as both a manual and a story. Rebel Assault 2 avoided any confusion of canon and opted to have its own story entirely this time around. One of the most heartbreaking facets of Disney's wiping of the Star Wars canon was some of the rich and original stories that were cast to the wayside. Kyle Katarn's was one of those stories. Many consider Dark Forces, to, which released in 95, to be one of the greatest Star Wars games ever created. At the time, the visuals were beyond impressive and even allowed the character to look up and down, jump, free aim, and introduce multi-step puzzles. But guess what? We're getting him back in the form of re-release on the Nintendo Switch, and I think the PS4 too, on September 24th. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves though, aren't we? Oh right, 1986, which was an amazing year for one reason and one reason only, my birth. Okay, two reasons. Shadows of the Empire for the Nintendo 64 and PCs released in November of 1996. The big deal with the Shadows of the Empire wasn't so much the game, which admittedly is a little clunky. Anyway, the overall narrative of Shadows of the Empire did something not done before, which was be a multimedia event. The idea was to make a film in between Empire and Return of the Jedi without actually making a film. So it was a video game, book, comic series, soundtrack, and it launched a ton of toys. It basically reinvigorated interest in the entire Star Wars franchise, which inspired the release of the specialized editions of Star Wars the following year, and only heightened from there with The Phantom Menace popping out in 1999. The thing with a good thing is that you can never have too much of it, supposedly. Until companies begin to understand that they can churn out anything under the name of a good thing and make a profit, which incidentally also happened. One of these garbage bombs was Masters of Terrace Kasai, which seems ridiculous on paper because Star Wars plus Mortal Kombat style fighting sounds like a match made in heaven, but nope. This PlayStation exclusive flopped big due to a plethora of issues including unbalanced character modes, an inferior fighting engine, and how the lightsabers were less like this, and more like this. Like me, like me, like me. A few other not so high points in the 90s were the ever exciting Yoda stories, which looked like it was made in Microsoft Paint, but that's not the point. Some like Star Wars Rebellion and others didn't, but you can't fault them for one doing something different considering the rest of the late 90s and early 2000s were about to be dictated by the prequels and trying to fill those canyon-sized holes together. And two, it tried to introduce Star Wars to the world of strategy games. But I can acknowledge that the effort was clearly there. The first Rogue Squadron reinvigorated things in 1998 was substantially better than was inspired it, with better handling, graphics, sound, story, and more. It was especially praised for utilizing the Nintendo 64's expansion pack, which upped the ante of its graphical merit. This, as well as Shadows of the Empire, of course, really set the tone for the kinds of stories that fans liked seeing, those that fit well within the canon and established heroes. 
To be blunt, it made flying look and feel just as fun as it should have felt all along. Not to mention it contained ridiculous amounts of unlockable content. And then, oh then, something happened in 1999. A certain movie was released that would change everything in the Star Wars canon. If you thought that Disney is going crazy with their determination to represent the current trilogy, you don't remember the sheer desperation of covering the prequels in all other media. And here's the thing, these prequel-centric games were popping out like Star Wars was going out of fashion. Up until this point, with a few exceptions of course, it felt like Star Wars video games were made with at least the intent of being good games, and that narratives were being infused into the media, because this was the time when people were discovering they liked stories in their games. And most of these games aren't even horrible. They're just so forgettable that I think they're all just kind of the same game sometimes. Especially since so many of them were racing games. Don't get me wrong, I actually really enjoy pod racing, even if the best experience I've ever had with it was in the LEGO video games. But the games during this era are just really... shallow? There's literally a game where Bobble had Star Wars characters race each other, and that was supposed to be a title that was sold on actual consoles. Why don't you do that? And the two Obi-Wan games we got, as well as most of the movie adaptations that released that were lightsaber-centric, were so slashy and without much thought into the combat. This is kind of a lame move when games such as Twisted Metal, Metal Gear Solid, and Final Fantasy were serving up much more skillful combos and creative displays of combat. Plus, we'd seen better with Star Wars in the past. We knew they could do better. We did have the best Rogue Squadron game in 2001, though, lest we not forget. Bounty Hunter is definitely playable and has its enjoyable parts but it could have been better given it was supposed to cover the crazy adventures of Jango Fett. Visually, it looks pretty good for 2002 and definitely holds up better than games such as The Clone Wars or Republic Commando. It just doesn't go the extra mile that it could have. The story isn't terrible as it does explain how Jango Fett became the clone template and does present formidable foes in the form of Kamari Vosa, but it lacks innovation as well as direction with its koopy controls and fairly empty, albeit large, levels. Collecting the bounties are fun, and the cutscenes are creative, making it a pretty fun time, but it just wasn't blowing anybody out of the water. Okay, but speaking of blowing people out of the water, that did come later in the form of another Kyle Katarn adventure in Jedi Outcast, the sequel to Dark Forces. Coming September 24th. As well as another with the sequel in Jedi Academy, which came out in 2003. Coming 2020. PCs, the Xbox, and GameCube saw these games hit the shelves, and they sold like hotcakes, and rightfully so. There's so much that's satisfying about these games. Actual thought is gone into the lightsaber combat, the plot and pace of the game rises in crescendos at the right points, and we see Kyle Katarn go through a proper narrative. You get to even fight alongside Luke. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that all of the lore makes 100% sense like how you have to realign with a Jedi to get the Force back and in order to get revenge, but rest assured it's a breath of fresh air in the ocean of mediocrity that flowed through the 2000s. The 2003 guys, this was where it was at. Why you may ask, when I'm being so cynical about the 2000s and their Star Wars games? Because a legend was born in this calendar year. And we also got the third Rogue Squadron, which was tragically garbage. Sorry little buddy. Knights of the Old Republic was the baller, and it's debatable amongst fans whether the first or second game is superior seeing as both have exceptional narratives, beautiful graphics, consistent updates, fan bases, and lore. But I'd argue that the first installation really ignited an interest in a period of Star Wars lore that hadn't yet been explored. Medieval Star Wars times? Hell to the yes! Game of Thrones made of lightsabers? That would hurt. It allowed the player to cultivate their own experience and it has come to the closest of any game to date, not including its sequel, that gives fans what they want, and that's to put themselves in the Star Wars story, complete with aligning with the dark side or light side of the Force, as well as a multitude of other choices. I won't spoil for anyone, but the plot twist still holds up as well as the characters we meet along the way. In 2004, the sequel released, and added to the already extensive continuity created by Knights of the Old Republic, basically making it its own universe, as it happens so far before the prequel trilogy chronologically begins. Plans for a third game naturally circulated, and Bioware expressed intense interest to bring it to life. Seeing as it only took a year for the second super successful game to pop out, you'd think that too, right? Pour one out for the homies and the legends of lost dreams. But also in 2004, you know what came? Battlefront, baby! What is it about Battlefront that just excites the hearts of many like no other? Well, not no other, because really what's almost unanimously considered the best in the franchise is its sequel. Battlefront 2, which came out a year later in 2005. 
considering its only competition that year was Republic Commando, Order 66, and Revenge of the Sith adaptation, it was a diamond in the rough. Except the original LEGO Star Wars game. You should already know my opinions on those gems. Battlefront 2 took first and third person shooters, added Star Wars to the remix, and perfected it. Not only did it look super pretty, but it really utilized the prequel era well by using its diverse scenery and characters, but still placing the main campaign in the original trilogy era. However, it did an excellent job promoting Revenge of the Sith with its content directly from the movie. Still, getting to play as a trooper in Vader's Fist, the 501st Legion, all across time and space while introducing elements from both trilogies, and getting to be Jedi Sith characters on certain occasions depending on the battlefield, engaging in missions, awesome controls, the option to skip space missions in the main campaign, everything about Battlefront 2 is almost everything that these games in this era haven't been, and in a lot of ways is everything games aren't now. It caters to the fans and gives an enjoyable narrative to play while also being heavily rooted in the action. Let me go ahead and emphasize the importance of the narrative here, just for later reference. Bottom line, Battlefront 2 is the best of its kind, and no, you won't change my mind. And then, barring LEGO games and expansions of course, we really had nothing for a while. Like I genuinely mean that, things peaked at Battlefront 2 for a while and never really, well, they never really got better. Mobile games started churning out, an ailment which we would see so much more of with the increased purchase rate of smartphones, because LucasArts was working on something big. And actually so big that they were working with George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic to create a video game engine unlike any other that was meant to be a new age of Star Wars video games. The Force Unleashed released in 2008 after being slated for a 2007 release on the, well, pretty much everything. The big three, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft, as well as PC and OS systems were all covered. Judging by the way they centered comics and a novel around the game, they were really shooting for another Shadows of the Empire-like project. Many were anticipating the release of The Force Unleashed because aside from its hype, it had been a really long time since a good lightsaber action-based game had come out, and this showed so much visual promise based on trailers and confidence from LucasArts. However, if you're looking for a diverse fighting system here, this ain't it. The story is definitely worth a playthrough in this one, putting us in between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope setting up the general disarray of the galaxy. You get to play the part of the bad guy and rip people to shreds, as well as explore interesting new additions to the Star Wars mythos. Galen Merrick is the secret apprentice to Darth Vader and entrained to do his bidding. Secrets are unveiled, familiar faces are seen, and while the plot twist isn't as impactful as Knights of the Old Republic's level of twisty, it's still pretty damn good, and it got a sequel in 2010! Sure did. The first Force Unleashed, while imperfect, felt like it belonged in canon. It established a compelling character and supplied more than enough content to abate Star Wars fans even if the controls were bland. This game changed some things, but not for the better. While gorgeously scored and designed, its brevity and lack of direction is evident. It just feels like it was made to sell another game as opposed to telling the story and having a really definitive purpose. This kind of set up precedence for a while though. Instead of putting their efforts and resources into a game, developers flung a bunch of cheaply made Star Wars apps onto the App Store. LucasArts was really banking on the world to end in 2012 as the Mayans predicted because they said, hey, here's an Angry Birds Star Wars game. You happy? But who could say art is dead when Club Penguin's Star Wars Takeover exists? So that's what's going on, Hoth. And heartbreakingly, it seemed to stay that way for a while. Then, all of our gamer dreams were supposedly coming true in the form of a revival of the coveted Battlefront series. And while both of these games are obviously very beautiful and impressive to physically play, they are shells of games ridden with microtransactions. The sequel is definitely better than the former, since it meets the very low bar of having a main campaign. Who releases a $60 game in this day and age without a main story? And we get it, we do. Businesses need to make a profit, and I'm sure the new Battlefront games have their followings. Or maybe not. It's not enough to have an impressive engine that makes you feel like you're actually in space or wielding a lightsaber anymore. Not when you have to pay so much for the complete editions of games. It does make you wonder how we got here. Even in my retrospective of games, it seems far-fetched. It was clear that the influx of success in the genre inspired the increased output of games and less time spent on said games, but still. To keep selling expansion packs in hopes of making the game a complete experience is just ridiculous. To release something unfinished and make people pay more for the continuation later feels wrong. I'm hoping the Jedi Fallen Order is different. Maybe it takes the effort put into the story of Force Unleashed and mixes with how well the combat and Battlefront is taken. 
if those two could combine forces, no pun intended, they'd patch together in a very thrilling experience. We've come so far on a technical basis, and that is never clearer than it is in Battlefront 2. But even though the attempt is there to have a story, it's still short, and it doesn't have the heart or intrigue of past projects. So what do you think? What are your favorite Star Wars games to date? Did I not cover it here? Did I cover it here? Did I deeply insult you? I'm sorry. Either way, let me know, and may the Force be with you. You guys have a great day.